What's going on everybody? My name is Greg Peters. You are watching the Car Passion channel and in today's video, I'm gonna show you how to put all of these parts into your Miata. All right, so if you did enjoy this video, if you did learn something, don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe if you are new, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out. If only it was that easy. Well, I guess if it was that easy, I wouldn't have a YouTube channel. So get ready to learn how to actually install all of these parts into your Miata. So, what are we doing today? We're gonna be replacing basically every maintenance item in the whole engine bay. I was gonna break this into multiple videos, but there's so much overlap, like I can't do a cooling system video without doing the water pump, which is part of the timing belt job. So anyways, I'm gonna be replacing everything today. I'm talking water pump, cooling hoses, timing belt kit, that's a ton of water lines in there and seals and a bunch of stuff. Spark plugs, valve cover gasket, spark plug wires, accessory belts, fuel pumps. We're just fuel pumps? Fuel filter is what I meant. The pump is fine for now. And to answer another question that I always get, where do I get my parts from? You guys can find all of this stuff at treasurecoastmiata.com. They were gracious enough to send me out some things that are gonna help me keep the NB on the road, which I'm very grateful for. What else do we have here? This is all transmission related stuff and I'm gonna wait to do that until I do the clutch on the NB because you already know that thing is gonna be making enough power to slip the stock clutch. And yeah, there's some more stuff in this Treasure Coast box that I have to open up. That's all for the NB. This is for the NB, that's for the NB. The ME442 still has to go in. Uh, of course, rev limiter gauges for the NB. That's for the NB. All that stuff back there is for the NA. That's for the NA. That weird shape box is for the NB. That's for the NA. That's for the NB. That this giant, this giant thing is for the NB. I gotta get this project going because it's taking up the whole garage. Anyways, I'm I'm acquiring things and buying things faster than I can make videos on. So I gotta get started on it. But we're gonna take out a couple boxes today because we're, we're doing everything in the engine bay. So you guys ready to learn something? You guys ready to fix your Miatas? I hope so, let's get started. Welcome to the 2020 Car Passion Ultimate Timing Belt video. Now I'm sure many of you are wondering why I'm doing another one of these when I already have one on the channel. Well, that video is over five years old now and I know that many of you have seen and maybe even enjoyed the sharp imagery of the Sony Handycam and the production value of the world-renowned Windows Movie Maker, I mean, you combine that with 21 straight minutes of background noise from a busy intersection. Disconnect your PCB hose. Let's just say the channel has come a long way since 2015, and I think this staple maintenance video deserves a remake. Plus, this is on an NB, and although it's mostly the same, I've still had many requests for it, and I'll be tackling way more jobs in this video anyways, including cooling hoses, fuel filter, shifter rebuild, ignition, and more. So, strap in, buckle up, and let's jump into it. If you're tackling all or most of the jobs that I'm doing in this video, your best friend here is gonna be to get as much stuff out of the way as possible. So drop that splash guard with a couple 10 millimeter bolts, and then drain the oil out of the pan and drain the coolant from the radiator. You're gonna wanna remove that radiator cap also, and then it will just explode out. Make sure you have a large enough receptacle to catch everything. Thing. Now while everything is draining, don't forget to disconnect that negative battery cable. Then get that intake out of the way with a couple Phillips head screws, unplug your intake air temperature sensor, your mass airflow sensor, or AFM if you have a 1.6, your breather tube, and the whole thing will pull out as one piece. Remove the upper radiator hose, disconnect your fans, remove the lower radiator hose, having your receptacle ready so you don't explode coolant everywhere like I just did here remove the upper radiator brackets, and then this thing can just pull right out. Don't forget about the little rubber grommets that sit below the radiator. They will fall out at will and just roll away. You're gonna have to put those back in when you reinstall the radiator. And look at how much space we've already generated in just a few minutes. Now is also a good time to start taking some pictures with your phone. As much as you think you're gonna remember how everything goes back together, you're probably gonna forget some things if this is your first time. So that's always a good idea. 
Speaking about remembering how everything goes back together, as much as I'd like to say this video will contain all the information needed for any beginner to do these jobs, it really is best to have a factory service manual or a Haynes manual or something like that by your side, just in case this video doesn't illustrate something perfectly. So I'm just opening up the thermostat housing here and pulling out this very stuck thermostat and removing some of these tiny cooling hoses. Now these things might be super seized onto your engine. So no worries if you can't pull them off, you can just cut them off with the razor blade because you are gonna be replacing them. Now look at how crunchy and crispy this cooling hose is right here. This cooling system basically was a ticking time bomb. The, who, these could be original. These could have 160,000 miles on them. And a hose like this, that costs a few bucks, can leave you completely stranded. Why would you risk it? And lucky for you, Treasure Coast Miata sells these hoses in complete kits. So you just tell them what kit you want and you know you're getting all the right parts guaranteed. Now as we go towards the back of the engine, these hoses get more and more tricky. You'll see I'm gonna remove this one here with one of my favorite tools, the hose persuader, we'll call it. I'll link that down below. That thing is totally epic. It'll get pretty much any hose off with ease. Now coming back here to the oil cooler, oil warmer, whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, it's pretty hard to get to from the top or the bottom, but if you remove what's called the intake manifold brace, and that's held in with just two 14 millimeter bolts on the top, and then one more 14 millimeter that sits just behind the alternator on the bottom. And once that comes out, bam, look at all that space you generated. You can remove your oil filter while trying not to spill everywhere which I consistently do throughout this video and behind the oil filter up above it there are two hose connections and these hoses are just as important as the rest of them even though they're way harder to get to and you'll notice here I have a mix of spring clamps and hose clamps normally from factory you're gonna have all spring clamps on there but if the car has been worked on before you might find some hose clamps so in this video you're getting a mix of all kinds of things so you got to get these things off and they can be pretty tricky but don't give up on me I'm right there with you once you get those off, you come around to the back of the engine, and this is pretty hard to see, but there's just one hose back there, and that one goes up to the oil warmer as well. Next, I'll remove the heater core hoses. This is pretty straightforward. If they are stuck, again, you can cut them off with a razor blade. You can see here, this thing is absolutely crusted out. You don't wanna use any crushing force to remove the hoses off the hard lines that come from the firewall. Those are pretty easy to damage, easier to damage on the NAs, but the NBs are still susceptible to crushing if you get too aggressive with it. Remove your lower radiator hose, and then you can see there's this hard line that goes back from the heater core hoses up to this mixing manifold that sits behind the power steering pump. Now that tube is actually bolted to the exhaust manifold and you don't have to remove it to do this job. I am going to unbolt the power steering pump to gain access to that and it's just gonna make this whole area a lot easier to work with. But before loosening the accessory belts to get to the power steering pump, loosen these three 10 millimeter bolts that hold the water pump pulley on because they're really hard to get loose once you remove the accessory belts. Now I'm not gonna fully remove the power steering pump to where I need to disconnect the lines. I'm just gonna unbolt it to get it out of the way. So the first part is just loosening up the tensioner bolt. And then you're gonna have this 14 millimeter in the front of the pump that you have to access through the pulley. If you don't have access through it, you just need to spin the engine a little bit and then throw a wrench on the back of it, loosen that up, loosen up the actual tensioning bolt and then it'll come loose. You can pull the power steering pump slash AC belt off. Same concept over on the alternator. You just need to loosen up this 12 millimeter bolt on the top, loosen up the tensioning bolt, and then down on the bottom, you'll have another bolt that comes in from the back of the alternator that just needs to be loosened up maybe a half a turn. And then this whole assembly will come loose and you can remove the alternator belt. Now I'm getting ready to pull the valve cover off. So let's get those plug wires out. You're gonna pull the cam sensor out if you do have a 99-2000. Pop out that PCV valve loosen up the coil bracket, which is actually bolted into the back of the valve cover, so you can't remove it without taking these bolts out. You don't have to remove the ignition coil bracket though. Loosen up all these valve cover bolts. I like to do it in a couple phases just because I'm a little bit OCD like that. And then that's it, you can pull your valve cover off. Now, I really wanna get all of this harness stuff completely out of the way, just out of my hair. It's just There's just so much going on here with the NBs, at least compared to the NAs. So you have some brackets here. If you pull the 10 millimeter bolts out from the upper timing cover, 
that pretty much holds this entire harness in place. And then you just unplug everything and you can pull it out of the way. Next up, remove the water pump pulley, and then you'll have four 10 millimeter bolts on the harmonic damper. Go ahead and loosen those up and you will be able to remove that completely. Now, prepare yourself for a battle of unknown proportions because sometimes this crank bolt is pretty easy to get off and sometimes it is very not easy to get off. So. I was trying to use a ratchet here with a jack handle on it and I got it. And I got it, I mean I broke my ratchet in half. Why was I using a 3 8 drive? Because I was too lazy to pull the sway bar off. So don't be me, just unbolt the four bolts that drop the sway bar. You can get a half inch drive ratchet and a big ol' persuader on there like this. Now you can see I was applying so much torque to this bolt Mind you, the car is in fifth gear, so the engine has the least amount of leverage against the tires. My girlfriend is in the car with the brakes fully depressed, e-brake fully pulled, and it's taking so much torque that it's trying to pull the car out of the jack stands. So uh, be mindful of that. We actually ended up putting the car on the ground, chalking the wheels. I put part of an engine stand on the end of this long ratchet, and I was finally able to get this thing broken loose. Okay, remove those lower timing covers, loosen up that timing belt tensioner, pull off the timing belt tensioner spring, remove the timing belt guide. This one is actually a little bit stuck here, but no big deal. And then free your timing belt. Now, notice I didn't put the engine at top dead center. It really doesn't matter on a stock engine, but it doesn't hurt to just put the engine at top dead center before you pull the belt. Either way, it's fine. I'm gonna show you how to line everything back up in just a few minutes. Now, the infamous timing belt gear, the little stuckling. Now, I got so much flack in my other video because my timing belt gear wasn't stuck and apparently everyone else's was. So maybe this will be the time that I'm paid back and my gear is gonna be super stuck on here. And all I have to say to you people is our houses might be expensive, but we got no rust out here. Watch this thing just come off with two fingers, no problem. Sorry. Not sorry. Now, if your gear is stuck on there, you can apply some heat to it. You can pry on it lightly with the pry bar, not enough to break your oil pump, but you can get some even pressure on the left and right sides and, and pry it off, you know? Next, the front crank seal has to come out. Now I just use a 90 degree pick and pretty much stick it into the seal and hook onto it and pull it out. It's very straightforward. It can be a little bit stuck, so it might take some force. The biggest thing here is you don't wanna damage any of the sealing surfaces. So let's take a closer look at this seal. If I flip it around, you can see that there's actually a metal ring inside of the seal, and that's what I'm pulling on with the pick. Now I'll remove the cam gears. This can be done by putting a large crescent wrench on the hexagonal flats that are on the camshafts and then loosening the bolts that hold the cam gears on. Remove the rear cam cap, remove the timing back plate, remove the front cam caps, and do my best to clean up any and all RTV that is on this. Uh, you want you want a really clean ceiling surface because then when you put your valve cover gasket on, it's not gonna leak afterwards. Now, to remove the water pump, the first thing I'm gonna do is take out this bolt on the power steering pump that I loosened earlier, and you'll be able to completely pull this thing out of the way, which will gain you access to the bolts that hold the mix housing to the water pump. So you wanna take these out first, get them out of the way, and then at that point you can remove the bolts that are in the water pump. You don't have to take this coolant neck off. I just did it so you guys could see what I'm working on a little bit better. So you just need to remove these four bolts along with the bolt that holds the alternator bracket on, and then you can pull the water pump off. Just a quick note here, now that we have both water pumps next to each other, you always wanna go for that 3D cast impeller style water pump, not the cheap stamp steel that you find at AutoZone. That's exactly what came off the car. You can see the design difference between the two here and the cast impeller is just a much better quality unit. It's made by Gates. It's the one that comes with the Treasure Coast kit and the cost difference is minimal, if anything. Now we're almost in a state of full disassembly here. The last thing is to get the mixing manifold off the engine, and then you'll have access to that O-ring that's left over. Now listen, the O-rings on some of your guys' Miatas are in this crusty, dusty condition, just ready to explode off and leave you stranded on the side of the road. So you need to get on this job. Now that everything's fully disassembled, you have to do the dirty work of cleaning all of the sealing surfaces. It's gotta be done, and the better job you do, the better this stuff is gonna seal and you're not gonna have any leaks. Now, there are several techniques. Oftentimes, the plastic razor blade does work wonders. I'll link down below the one that I'm using here. 
Sometimes you need to give it uh, some scrubbing with various brushes or use some solvents. Another method I've used, and I've never had anything leak doing this, but you know, if it seems sketchy to you, obviously don't do it, is to take some 220, 320 grit sandpaper on a very flat piece of wood and run your part over it. Obviously this is only for flat parts, but it does a very good job at cleaning everything off and making sure that you have a perfectly flat ceiling surface. If you've made it this far, congratulations. We're officially at the halfway mark and it's time to start bolting on all of this brand new stuff. The car is gonna run so nice and smooth when all this stuff is finished. And I gotta make sure this thing's in tip top shape because we're getting it ready for nitrous. We're getting it ready to throw all kinds of stuff at it, make big power, and it's gonna be fun. So I'm gonna start by installing the front crankshaft seal. Sometimes this can press in all the way by hand. Sometimes it's a little bit more stubborn. The biggest thing here is you don't wanna push it in too far because it's hard to pull it back out without damaging it. So you can get it like almost all the way in by hand and then take a flat handle, like a piece of wood like this and tap it in and you won't be able to push it too too far in as long as you let it overhang to the oil pump kind of acts as a stopper you want to make sure this thing is as flat as possible so it doesn't leak now getting the cam seals in is actually very easy this is the reason I removed the cam caps you just put the seals in easily push them in with your fingers and then reinstall the cam caps to the proper torque. Absolutely do not mix up the intake and exhaust cam caps. That's extremely important. The exhaust side is marked with an E and the intake side is marked with an I. Now the proper torque here is 100 to 125 inch pounds not foot pounds, that's inch pounds of torque, eight to 10 foot pounds. Get that rear cam cap reinstalled in the same fashion and it's time to install the cam gears. Now, the cam gears are identical. You can switch them between the intake and exhaust and it doesn't matter. But what does matter is how you put them on each cam. It's very easy to remember. The locating pin on the cam has to point to the letter on the cam gear based on which cam it is. So on the exhaust cam, the pin will always face the E. On the intake cam, the pin will always face the I. If you install your cam gear like this and the pin faces the Z, you're not gonna have a good time because all your timing marks can line up perfect and the car will not start. Z stands for the car will not start. Now the water pump can go back on. I'm actually using an OEM Mazda gasket that came with the Treasure Coast kit. And the water net can go back on. I did not have an O-ring here, so I used RTV where the O-ring would go. Don't forget to put your timing backplate on before you install your cam gears. And then put the nice new O-ring back on the heater core hard pipe. Put the mixing manifold onto that O-ring. And then you'll kind of have to hold onto that thing, slip the gasket into place, get the bolts started. And once those are started, it'll be easy to just tighten them down. Now the coolant hoses that go on the side of the engine, very difficult to film the actual install of these things, but it's pretty intuitive where they go based on their shape. And you just slip them onto the ports and tighten them down. Okay, let's get that alternator bracket tightened back up. We're gonna put the timing belt idler pulley on. You can fully tighten that down. The timing belt tensioner, you can install it, but you just wanna make that bolt finger tight to where the tensioner itself can still slide back and forth. Next, put the key back in the crankshaft. Know that there is a correct way to install this. If you put it on wrong, you won't be able to get the crank gear on. So if it slides on like this, then you're good. Put your timing belt guide on, and next comes the part that everyone is afraid of, but don't worry, Miata Dad is here to talk you through the process. It is not very difficult. Of course, there are a hundred different ways to do this, but this way here I think is pretty beginner friendly. The first thing I do here is rotate the crankshaft about a half a tooth counterclockwise. And then I'm gonna set up the trifecta of awesomeness to lock these cams at top dead center. That's the I on the intake cam facing up and the E on the exhaust cam facing up, a 12 o'clock position. Now put the belt on the crankshaft and the exhaust cam gear. Now the reason I rotated the crankshaft slightly counterclockwise is so there's a little bit of slack between the crank and the exhaust cam gear. Once you have the belt on the exhaust cam gear, you can rotate the crank clockwise, which will then tighten up that slack and give you a little extra slack over on your left side, which you'll need it in just a second. And then you can zip tie the belt to the exhaust cam gear and it won't go anywhere. And for this part, I like to rotate that intake cam gear slightly clockwise, which will give me a little bit of slack between the two cam gears. Once that's on, I'll rotate the cam back to top dead center and that'll give me enough slack over on the 
left side of your screen to slip that timing belt over the tensioner. Once it's over the tensioner, you can reinstall the tensioner spring and everything should be lined up. You only gotta check a couple things to make sure your belt is installed properly. The crankshaft needs to be at top dead center. That means the little divot in the gear lines up with the arrow. Now, at the same time, on the exhaust cam gear, there's an eye that lines up with an eye on the back plate behind the cam gears. You're gonna count 19 teeth between the timing marks on your cam gears. And then over on the intake cam, there's an E which will have a mark that lines up with an E on that timing back plate. In order to tension the timing belt from top dead center, you're gonna turn the engine over one and five sixths of a time. I know that's very specific, but it's what the service manual calls for. Basically, if you wanna make sure you've turned it the right amount, there needs to be no slack at all between the crank and the exhaust cam gear or between the two cam gears. All of the slack needs to be over on the tensioner side that's gonna let the spring do its job take up the slop and then you will tighten up your timing belt tensioner. If your timing belt is not tightened properly, then your engine will sound like this when you start it up again. All right, let's get these lower timing covers put back on and you can put the upper timing cover in place, but don't put the bolts in yet because of all those little brackets that hold the wiring clips on. For the trigger wheel, do not put this thing on backwards. You can see in the center part of it sticks up. That part goes towards the harmonic balancer. And put your balancer on for 10 millimeter bolts. And for the water pump pulley, you can just thread those bolts in. You're not gonna be able to fully tighten them until you put the belt on, which you can do next. After you get this all tensioned up and tightened down, then you can tighten the 10 millimeter bolts. Don't forget those things. Next, put your power steering belt on and reassemble that tensioner in the reverse order. Now look at this thing's coming together nice. The whole front of the engine's pretty much done now. Next up is gonna be the valve cover gasket. Now, I don't know who decided to RTV this entire gasket on, but I really don't recommend it. So you gotta clean all this out if this is the case on your car. I do not use any RTV on the valve cover gasket except, of course, on the cam caps. There are six different locations that you need to put RTV in order to stop oil from leaking out of those places. Then drop that valve cover back on, then tighten up those bolts in sequence to 75 inch pounds. All right, let's get this ignition system put back together. Now, if your plugs and wires are old, it can lead to hesitation, worsened fuel economy, loss of power, and it's a relatively cheap thing to replace. My spark plug of choice here are the BKR6Es. They're only about $10. And in my opinion, you don't, you don't need anything more expensive than that. I run the BKR 7Es on my 400 horsepower car and I've never had any problem with them. The spark plug wires, I don't really like to cheap out on those. I go for the NGK Blues and you wanna make sure those are in the right order or else the car will not fire up properly. You can pause the video here if you need to check out how they go back in. Let's hop back here to the heater core hoses. Now, if the hard lines coming out of your firewall are crushed like one of mine is here, you can use a 10 or a nine millimeter socket, whatever fits best to kind of round that out. If they're crushed bad enough, even a brand new hose will leak there. So you wanna make sure that's in relatively good shape before you get your heater core hoses back on. Now I'm just buttoning up the last small water line here and dropping that thermostat into place. Now the side with the spring is gonna to go towards the engine and the little bypass valve, you wanna make sure that's at the 12 o'clock position before you finish putting your housing back together. Now you can swing that wiring harness back across the front of the engine and get everything plugged in. Now all the plugs pretty much are different shapes here so you really can't mess this up. Plus based on the lengths, you'll just see where everything goes. If you did remove this ground on top of your throttle body, make sure you don't forget that. That is a very important ground. Once that's all done, you can drop your radiator back in and fasten those upper brackets. Install your lower radiator hose, hop back up to the top and get that upper radiator hose put back on. Put your intake system back in. Of course, don't forget the mass airflow sensor plug and intake temperature sensor plug. And this thing's pretty much ready to fire up. Don't forget to put oil and coolant in, of course. While I have it sitting here, I know it's lost its fuel pressure. I'm gonna go ahead and replace this fuel filter. 
Fuel filter replacement is almost the same for NAs and NBs. You just hop under the right rear wheel well and pull this panel off and you'll have full access to that fuel filter. Drop that 10 millimeter out so you can, basically you wanna quickly swap this thing because as soon as you pull the fuel lines off, it will start draining your entire fuel tank. The main difference here is the NBs use quick disconnects on most of their fuel hoses. So you need a special tool. They are not very expensive at all. I was going to brag to you guys about how this set was about $8 and link it below. But what I found out, as you can see here uh, from me struggling for five minutes to use a simple tool, is that the Amazon Fuel line disconnect tools I bought were too fat. So I actually had to Dremel this thing down just a little bit until it actually fit here. Now, I'm going to give you a close-up shot of what it looks like to quick disconnect a fuel line because it's kind of hard for me to show you under the car. So you just put it on the hard line, slip it into the fitting, and the line just pops off. Now, one pro tip you can employ to avoid having to matrix dodge a stream of fuel is you can actually quick disconnect the line and get it over the ridge without fully pulling the line off and it will still seal and not leak anything. So what you can do is actually release the clips on both of the fuel lines and then you can quickly just pull them off, get that new filter in, and then to reinstall the lines, it's very easy. You just push them on until you feel them click and it should be relatively drama free. After you get that in, just reinstall your panel and what I always love doing is pulling the old fuel filter off and pouring the excess fuel out of it backwards to see how much debris and just nasty stuff is in there. Check this out, look how brown that is. So I am glad that I replaced this thing. And if you don't know the history on your fuel filter, it's not a bad idea to change yours. Now we can start buttoning things up. We're gonna get that oil filter in place, get some oil in this engine, fill the cooling system up all the way to the top, make sure your overflow tank is at the right level. And then just go ahead and start the car up and let it warm up with the nose up in the air. That's gonna help any air bubbles that are in the cooling system make it to the top. It's probably gonna drink some coolant when you fire it up, so keep an eye on that level and add as necessary. And while the car's warming up, this gives you a good chance to take a look underneath and check for any leaks. Go ahead and look at every hose connection, every gasket, basically everything you touched and make sure it's not leaking any coolant or oil. And after it comes all the way up to temperature, you can seal up that radiator. Go ahead and check your oil dipstick, make sure you're at the right level. And you should be ready to take it for a drive at this point. But there's one more issue that I gotta get taken care of. It's gotta be the most annoying thing about driving it at this point. And that is, look at the condition of this. Okay, we got not only an upper torn shift boot, but we also got a lower shift boot that's torn and the turret seal is torn. So it just smells like gear oil and exhaust and the shifter is sloppy and it's just a mess. So let's hammer out this rebuild real quick. The shifter rebuild, a very easy procedure. And if your Miata is over 100,000 miles, you probably need one. You see that? That's the ground. You shouldn't be able to see the ground from inside of your car. So to get this lower boot off, it's just four bolts. You can pull it out. And the turret ceiling plate, also not in very good shape. There is just delicious gear oil everywhere, which smells nice, and is accelerated into the car via the air going underneath, which is also heated up by that exhaust system. This thing's a heater, whether you want it to be or not. Three 10 millimeter bolts, and you'll be able to pull out the whole shifter assembly. If you have an early five speed, you will not need to worry about this part right here because you only have one pin, but the late five speeds have the dual guide pins, which I think leads to a better shifter feel. They are pressed in pretty hard, but a pro tip for getting these out is just using a box end wrench. I'm using a 12 millimeter and a vice grip you don't need to push it all the way out, just enough to get it nearly flush and far enough to get those lower rings out of the shifter turret. You'll need to suck out all that old fluid as well. The OEM shifter bushing just pops off of the tip of the shifter. You might be able to slide this upper turret plate off, but if your rubber was as hard as mine, you're gonna have a difficult time with that. I actually had to razor blade until the opening was large enough to slide off the shifter. But this OEM shifter rebuild kit also came from Treasure Coast Miata. To get started, just drop in that wavy washer and then follow it by this black bushing. Make sure the divots actually line up with those pins. Once once those two pieces are in, you can push the guide pins back into the turret, which you can either use a chisel and a hammer for like this, or use a vice grip and a rag to just squeeze at the last bit of the way in there. The upper part of the shifter also has a metal wavy washer with these teeth on it and an upper bushing. 
So that just clicks into place like that and then slides onto the shifter. You'll wanna put some kind of lubricant on the shifter to slide this boot over it. That goes all the way down. Make sure the cutaways in this bushing line up with the grooves in the shifter. Push the lower shift boot onto the shifter, but not all the way down, just to the base. Fill your turret back up with fluid. I think the right amount is about 75 cc's, but I just fill it until the fluid level goes just over where the shifter base sits. I am modifying the OEM shifter rebuild kit slightly by using this Miata Roadster Delrin shifter bushing. So I just take this and drop it into place inside the turret, drop that shifter back into place, tighten up those 10 millimeter bolts, then you can tighten down your new lower shift boot. If you're like me and had a ripped upper shift boot, that's also very easy to replace, starting with just four Phillips head screws. Pull this out. It's got a little plastic piece that holds everything in place. The factory shift boot just pulls off of this thing. I got a new shift boot from Redline Goods. I bought a bunch of boots from these guys and they're always really good quality, highly recommended. Now this thing is looking pretty fresh. I'll put back together, but you OGs already know what's next. It's the almighty, all powerful Ballcock shank washer. This is available in the racing aisle of Home Depot and it gives the shifter a bit of a cleaner look. The final and most difficult decision of the day is gonna be which shift knob I wanna run on here. I still got the factory knob, but I kinda of wanna spruce it up. So I got this Nismo knob, I got my form function wood PewDiePie knob, but I think I'll go for something classy and just leave this Tomei shift knob on here. And look at that, it's just beautiful. But more importantly, it feels excellent after the rebuild. Okay, trust me, of all the people out there, I know when you first get your Miata, the only thing you're thinking about is mods and more power. But if you just hunker down and get your maintenance done, do your timing belt kit, especially if you don't know the history of the maintenance on the car, it's gonna pay dividends, okay? It's gonna pay off in the end. You're gonna feel so much better about your car. You don't wanna get stranded over some stupid cheap coolant hose that busted. You don't wanna be 20, 30, 40 horsepower down just because your timing was off by a couple teeth. It's not a good place to be. So if you enjoyed the 2020 rendition of Car Passion's Ultimate Timing Belt Guide, NB style, don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe if you are new, and check out Treasure Coast Miata. They got you covered for everything you could possibly need. I will see you in the next one. Peace out.